Hello, I'm Dr. Son Hyun Lak from Newton Clinic in South Korea. Today's topic is about the UV implant. And just to give you some uh, background on this topic, I want to go over the basic history of implants with regard to this UV implant surface treatment. During the Branamark era, when he made his endosseous implants, he claimed that it was better to have a smooth surface. On the contrary, when ITI implant came out by Sraman, they claimed that a rough surface was better. And so this be became a debate. But of course now, we've confirmed very obviously that rough surfaces are better. Then came the if issue. The problem was, all right, if rough surfaces are good, how do we make it rough? Strawman at this time got good results with a surface called SLA, which formed two fold craters through sandblasting with large particles coupled with acid etching. Due to problems with patents though, and the difficulty in mimicking Strawman's technology, other companies came up with a different way to roughen the surface, which they called RBM, and many, many companies still use this RBM today. Even after the patent expired, it was difficult to replicate SLA, but through the years, this problem is solved, and now a lot of companies use SLA. It has become widespread and very commonly used. If we just look at one advantage of SLA over RBM, it's due to the titanium oxide layer that is formed on the SLA surface. This layer is essential due to its ability to promote cell activity, and the SLA has this part. However, for the RBM surface, no matter how much we look through the SEM microscope, this layer was never consistent, and in some cases, it never formed correctly. And so, it became known that the prognosis of RBM surface was much worse compared with the SLA surface. Again, if we look at the microscope image of SLA, we can see that the surface is composed of these twofold craters. So, it was proven that better conduction of osseo integration was achieved, and we can see the cell proliferation and also see the collagen network forming on the surface through many studies. But then there's this problem. When implants are fresh out of the product production line, they show this hydrophilic characteristic where the water is almost like absorbed onto the surface. But after even just one day, we can see some hydrophobicity start to come on. Then after one week, then three months, the implant loses all hydrophilicity and becomes completely hydrophobic. And due to its reaction to water, it results in a condition where optimal osseo integration becomes an uncertainty. It has since been concluded that the longer the implant stays on the shelf, the worse it is for optimal osseo integration. So now we knew about the advantage of SLA, but since this titanium aging happens no matter what, as time passes, coming up with a solution to this aging became important. If we like, look at this, uh, this scientific article here by Jia Nishen, published in Jomi in 2016, five groups of implants were placed in the tibia and thigh portion of rabbits, each with 32 implants, and the animals were then sacrificed to measure the implant's removal torque once at three weeks and once at six weeks. The implants were grouped as follows. Fresh from production SLA implants were labeled SLA new. The second group of SLA implants on the left uh, in, were left in normal packaging and exposed to the environment for four weeks called SLA old. The third group was like SLA active from Strawman. SLA new was stored in saline solution for four weeks, then implanted. 
The fourth group was basically the second group, the SLA old implant, but then treated with UV light immediately before implantation. And the last fifth group was basically the third group, the, uh, the SLA active, the mod SLA group treated with UV light before implantation. As you can see in this table, only the two second group was hydrophobic. In other words, all the other groups besides this one was hydrophilic. Also, the five groups of implants were tested using a method called XPS to measure the amount of carbon on their surface. They found that, of course, the carbon ratio on the SLA old group was very high, and both the UV-treated implants showed comparatively less carbon than the SLA new group. And through the results of the removal torque measurements, we can confirm that the removal torque of the SLA old and mod SLA were a little bit lower than that of SLA new. And on the other hand, we confirm that the UV treated implant groups had significantly higher removal torque measurements. The next table shows the results of BIC measurements. We can confirm here that the BIC levels were much higher with the UV-treated implant groups, and also we conclude that there was no significant difference in BIC between the regular UV-SLA and UV-SLA submerged in saline. Though through this publication, um, and also through our own clinical cases, we can see that UV-treated implants have stronger reverse torque and better aseo integration. But now we should be able to understand the reasons for such results and how to properly take advantage of its effects. That's the point of my talk today. I want to explain this main topic at four levels, the molecular level, the cellular level, the implant level, and the clinic level where we discuss how it practically is used in our clinics. Let's first look at the molecular level. When titanium implants age, hydrocarbon matter sticks to the surface. That's just science, it's natural. Let's take a look at the process of how UV light exposure removes these hydrocarbons. These particles of hydrocarbons are stuck on the surface of an aged titanium implant. When UV radiation hits the surface, a reaction called radicalizing takes place and these hydrocarbons are removed through evaporation. This is the general process of how a clean surface is obtained. Let's delve a little deep, bit deeper into this process. According to research, this kind of titanium aging is seen even within one hour after production of the implant. Hydrocarbons attach themselves, and the more time passes, the more they attach. So when UV radiation hits, the titanium surface becomes energized, releasing electrons and a pair of charges due to the energy. Then oxygen molecules in the air react with the negative charge on the surface to create a reactive oxygen ion called superoxygen oxide anions. This compound has high oxidation power, so it, it is, it's highly reactive. Okay? In addition, water molecules in the air meet with the remaining positive charge and lose an electron, forming hydroxyl radical ions, which are also strong reactive oxidizers. Due to their high reactivity, these hydroxyl radicals bond with the hydrocarbons on the surface to form H2O and CO2, then evaporate into the air. Similarly, the remaining superoxide anions also bond with the hydrocarbons, repeating the same reaction and causing the carbon to evaporate into H2O and CO2. When the UV radiation is finished, the hydrocarbons on the surface have all disappeared and thus results in a super clean surface. So in UV photofunctionalization, it is a critical point that the hydrocarbons are removed from the surface 
and the implant surface is returned to its original state. The original state of titanium surface actually carries a positive charge, but the hydrocarbons change the surface to have a negative charge. But through the UV radiation process, this negatively charged surface not only returns to its original positive charge state, the charge actually gets stronger. The other critical effect of UV treatment has to do with water. H2O molecules carry a negative charge. They are magnetically attracted to the positively charged titanium implant surface. So we call this effect hydrophilicity. So there are numerous tests to show this. UV-treated implants attract and absorb water, while non-UV-treated ones repel water. The UV implant on the left, you can clearly see that the blood is being pulled into the thread grooves. Conventional implants, on the other hand, not only dislike the blood, it looks like it hates it. It pushes the blood away. Because blood carries a negative charge and the implant also is negative, the magnetic effect is repulsion. And the older the implant gets, the more this effect is enhanced and has a greater effect on osseointegration. integration. To summarize, when titanium implants are first produced, the surface is perfectly clean with no hydrocarbons. This means that the implant carries an original positive charge and results in it being hydrophilic. As time passes, biologic aging takes place and this state changes. The implant ends up repelling moisture and water due to the hydrocarbons making the implants carry a negative charge. But when UV radiation is given to the implant, the implant is returned to its original state. And if the radiation continues, the implant's original positive charge becomes enhanced and amplifies the hydrophilic effect. So that was the molecular level explanation. And now it's time for the cellular level. So let's look at how cells react when the implant surface charge changes. In order to understand the cellular level, we must first understand the process of osseointegration. integration. So let me touch on this first for a bit. Now, imagine that an implant was just placed. The surrounding bone is fractured, damaged, and blood vessels are hemorrhaged. Plasma proteins called albumin, fibrinogen, and fibronectin spill out in between the broken blood vessels. The important thing is that cells which carry a negative charge will be strongly attracted to the positively charged implant surface. Now after this, platelet aggregation must take place to form blood clots. So this shows this process. After this, a type of cytokine which acts as messengers, such as thromboxane or PDGF, is secreted and signals non-differentiated stem cells to differentiate into fibroblasts. Following this, fibers called fibrin monomers come out from the platelets and form a web-like structure called fibrin network. These are all processes of blood clot formation. So now when forming the blood clot, another very important factor is produced during the process, which paves the way for bone formation called the provisional matrix. Then after about three to four days, fibroblasts, which form the collagen network, migrate to the site and then they begin to create collagen, elastin, and proteoglycans. Around the blood vessels are undifferentiated mesenchymal cells. These are a type of stem cell, and the first thing they need to do when the implantation takes place, of course, is to find and heal the damaged vessels around the implant. 
So new blood vessels are then formed. And through this process of vascularization or angiogenesis, the area too becomes well oxygenated so that the surrounding cells can perform properly. The next set, step is to start the process of osteogenesis, but first, osteoclasts are activated. Osteoclasts attach to the fractured edge of damaged bone and begin resorption. This is to create, spe create space for new bone to form. During this process, cytokines such as BMP and TGF-beta are secreted and these send signals for new bone to form. These signals are received by the mesenchymal cells, which I mentioned earlier, which not only serve to create new blood cells, but also turn into osteoblasts since they are undifferentiated to begin with. These cells migrate to the implant surface and finally differentiate into osteoblasts. These cells absorb onto the implant surface, either on the surface or on top of bone. The important thing to know here is that the mesenchymal cells cannot attach to the surface without the help of plasma proteins which were first spread onto the surface in the beginning of this whole process. After attaching, the mesenchymal cells then differentiate into osteoblasts upon receiving the signal from BMP produced by the osteoclasts. These organic compounds then use calcium phosphate to strengthen and begin the process of bone generation. So the woven bone forms here and later turns into denser bone. When we look at the interface between the bone and the implant surface through a microscope, it looks like the bone is sticking right up against the titanium surface. But if we take a closer look through an electron microscope, we can see that there is actually a thin protein layer between the bone and the titanium surface. This layer is what the albumin and fibronectin the plasma proteins are, which I mentioned earlier. I think this part is very important. So after formation of trabecular bone, weak, phone is bo uh, weak bone is formed. Then after the remodeling process, this bone turns denser into hard bone, which can withstand loading. And we call this entire process osseointegration. Here what we must point out and recognize is the role played by the UV. The first major thing is this. It's that the albumin, fibrinogen, and fibronectin attach to the implant surface. These proteins carry a negative charge on their surface, a minus charge. So if the surrounding implant surface charge is also negative, then they will not easily be attracted and stick to the surface. If the implant surface is positive, then they will be easily attracted and stick to the surface. But if hydrocarbons are stuck on the surface and turn the surface to have a negative charge, then it would be difficult for these proteins to stick to the surface. Normally, they do not stick. These proteins must stick to the surface which allows the blood vessels to also stick and also causes the mesenchymal stem cells to stick to the surface as well. All of this has to do with membrane potential, electromagnetism. These things need to happen in order for aseo integration to happen. Same with the concept of the protein layer between bone and implant surface. This must exist. Let's look at another scientific publication. The author is Takahiro Ogawa, a professor from UCLA, and he's quite commonly known for his work with UV photofunctionalization. He's contributed imme uh, immensely to this specific concept. Um, in this 2014 publication, the study compared at a cellular level 
the form uh, the bone formation on the surface of UV treated uh, titanium surface versus non UV treated titanium surface the study confirmed that there was immensely much more bone on the UV treated surface even when osteoblasts were di di uh, dispersed on the disc surface it was confirmed that the UV treated surface had a much higher concentration of bone cells after leaving it for three hours so Dr. Ogawa proved that a non-UV treated implant as it ages turns into a negatively charged surface here what is labeled as RGB are proteins and cells these things have a negative charge on their surface of course negative and negative cannot meet cannot meet magnetically this is why we need calcium ion if we don't have these ions osseo integration cannot occur in the proper order but uv uv treated implants have a surface that has turned to have a positive charge so the proteins and cells can directly attach themselves without any help and still be effective so we just went over the cellular level the next level is the implant level um, and how it functions and the clinical level as well so the effect of the removal of hydrocarbons or the change in the charge property of the surface or the improved hydrophilicity or increased proliferation of cells due to absorption of plasma proteins all equate to two things first faster healing and second strengthening so with this in mind let's let's investigate first faster healing as I mentioned earlier faster process of osseo integration means clinically faster or earlier loading is possible and in some cases immediate loading is even possible so this is very meaningful when we talk about stability an essential discussion is about how the stability changes after implantation before we had UV implants and when we did flap surgery a lot of bone chips end up being stuck within the osteotomy after implantation due to the drilling this results in a high final insert insertion torque high fixation but as I mentioned earlier the osteoclasts will melt these bone chips then of course as time passes the mechanical stability gained during initial stability is all lost but as new bone is formed even though biologic stability was zero in the beginning as time passes it will improve and become biologically stabilized we as clinicians can't exactly separate these two parts because they are all part of one process but from the clinician's perspective we evaluate stability as a combination of these two concepts and it goes like this we often express timing after implantation as third week or fourth week after implantation we know this to be the weakest point in stability and we have established theory that we must pass this weak point time period in order to do the loading but as I mentioned earlier UV implant is faster it attracts cells faster so this entire curved line shifts to the left because the phase of secondary biologic stability happens faster along the timeline we can have this effect and as a final result the total stability line increases as you see here so a core factor of this UV implant is that the UV can secure a much more reliable stability compared to the conventional implant if we look at the publication by Akiyoshi Funato who studied the success rate and healing time and stability of UV implants 
This study looked at the ISQ values comparing between 222 non-UV treated implants and 162 UV treated implants. The result was that the non-UV treated implants were able to be loaded at an average of 6.5 months after implantation compared to an average of 3.2 months for loading with UV treated implants, twice faster. Looking at the chart for timing of loading, this green portion is where loading happened three to six months after implantation. And above that is when it took more than six months for loading. If you look here below, this black portion is when immediate loading was done. So this study confirmed that UV-treated implants had more chances for loading, for immediate loading, and also took less time in general for loading. So I want to show you one of my cases. Um, this patient's upper anterior teeth had some roots in bad condition, so they needed to be extracted. So uh, four implants and a bridge restoration was planned after extraction. We used guided surgery to perform flapless surgery. So the surgical guide was designed, as you can see. Um, this is the SD radiograph after implantation. Um, and then uh, I then brought the patient in on a weekly interval and took the ISQ measurements starting with the operation day. And the smallest measurement, which was on operation day, was 65. On the tooth number 23, uh, it was as high as 80. After two weeks, all four implants had surpassed ISQ value of 70. Now, higher than 70 means it is stable. And if I were to just trust this number, then loading would be possible. Uh, but since this case had a study objective, and also the patient uh, didn't want early loading, we loaded the implants after five weeks. Uh, the patient was more than 65 years old, so for insurance reasons, we restored the right side with PFM and the left side with zirconia. Now, uh, before we did this study, if I had a full arc maxilla case, I would submerge the implant and let it heal for at least three months. But I'll show you an example of a case when I restored a full arc in one month. And this goes to show that the UV implant does definitely have a clinical advantage. Uh, so this is a full mouth case. Full mouth cases are even more dramatic, right? Uh, the remaining teeth, as you can see, all needed to be extracted. Uh, a little bit after extraction, we planned immediate loading after implantation and designed the surgery like this. Pre-treatment intraoral scan was taken. Um, set up the alignment of the final prosthetic and planned the implants, designed the guide, and printed the guides. And then the surgery. So uh, 14 implants were all placed on the same day, and this table shows the bone qualities. We didn't take the SISQ uh, values after the surgery, but for number 26 and number 27, 
we also had to raise the sinus. 26 and 27 bone condition was like this, as you can see. And the surgery went rather well, and the pre-designed prosthetic was seated. And this is the photo of the patient before he left the clinic that day. Uh, it was a full mouth case, but through the help of guided surgery, the implantations and prost prosthesis was complete within four hours. The patient was quite happy. He had a smile on his face as he left my clinic. Um, and being able to do a case like this with immediate loading on a full mouth is important, but more important is enabling this patient to be able to chew and eat after the surgery. And it was through the help of the prosthetic, but I don't think it would have been possible without the guide and the UV implant. I think the combination of these two, the guide and the UV implant, is the ultimate combination that exists on the market today. To add to this graph that we saw earlier, if we add on the flapless surgery factor, I think it will look like this. With flapless, the secondary stability curve will move a little bit more to the left. And the reason is because cells create bone. And in order for bone to form quickly, the blood supply is important. And instead of flap surgery, which cuts off the blood supply, flapless surgery, which completely preserves the gingiva's blood supply, is much more effective in safely increasing the stability. The combination of the surgical method and the use of the UV implant I think we can achieve the most optimal result. Now, so if I say it's faster, then one could say it's just a matter of time. So I'll just wait. I have plenty of time. I thought this too at first. But what is more important is that this UV implant is stronger. And what I mean by stronger is this. These kinds of studies are continuing to be published. If we check the BIC, the bone to implant contact, throughout the time period, at two weeks after implantation, the UV treated implant has much higher BIC than the non UV treated implant. And after eight weeks, the BIC level reaches almost 80, and we can confirm that the amount of bone that is in contact with the implant is much stronger with the UV treated implant. Now, because the BIC is higher, we can also affirm that a shorter implant can be used given the same case environment. Now, to show this, we take a look at this case where we need to place two implants on the number 15 and number 16 sites. Uh, when we went to the planning, we saw that in order to place a 10 millimeter length implant, we needed to raise the sinus. But if we use the shorter 8.5 millimeter implant, no sinus elevation was necessary. It was a peculiar case. Um, the patient requested to opt away from sinus augmentation and grafting due to financial and other concerns. So we went ahead and used the 8.5 millimeter implant and proceeded without raising the sinus. The usual method was used to plan and design the treatment. I then checked the ISQ value, and in the beginning, it was 65 and 72. But after two weeks, the number 16 tooth, which was 65 value 
at first increased to 75 in only two weeks. We saw that this patient's ASEO integration rate was quite fast and we were able to restore with the final prosthesis after four weeks. I think we were able to do this because the BIC was sufficiently high. Now let's look at a more complicated case. What I mean by complicated is a case that involves immediate implantation after extraction or a case that needs GBR or cases involving sinus augmentation. Before we get into the cases, let me first explain this concept of osteogenesis after implantation. There are two types. So here, after the osteotomy and we place the implant, osteoblasts are created from the surface of the bone where the bone grows inward towards the implant. We call this uh, distance osteogenesis. On the other hand, the process when the, bone, when the bone grows outward from the implant surface towards the bone surface is called contact osteogenesis. These two types of osteogenesis processes should happen simultaneously in order for ASEO integration to complete quickly. Now assume that if the implant surface charge is negative, as I explained earlier, and its ability to attract proteins and cells are not enough, insufficient, then this distance osteogenesis, where the bone growth only happens from the osteotomy wall inwards toward the implant, uh, would happen. And because of this, it takes more time. This is even more so with a case involving immediate implantation after extraction. The time needed for ASEO integration will increase and the amount of bone in contact with the implant will also be small because the bone is only growing from the surface of the bone inwards towards the implant. On the other hand, if the implant surface carries a positive charge, it will attract these cells and proteins and vigorously induce this contact osteogenesis, leading to fast generation of strong bone, even in cases with immediate implantation after extraction cases uh, or with GBR cases. If we look at this study published in JOMI in 2016 by Dr. Makoto Hirota, he studied uh, his study involved a comparison between 24 non-UV treated implants, 15 of which were basic cases and 8 of which were complex cases, compared with 25 UV treated implants, 4 of which were regular cases and 21 of which were complex cases. What this study looked at was ISQ and ISQ1 here is the value measured immediately following implantation, and ISQ2 was the value measured during the second surgery. The important observation was not the magnitude of the values, but the amount of change in the values between the two measuring points. This graph summarizes the result with a value called the ASEO Integration Speed Index, OSI. This value is obtained by taking the difference in the values between ISQ1 and ISQ2, then dividing that difference by the number of months between the two measurement time periods. Then we can get an index of comparison for the speed of ASEO integration, and the result is as follows. The non-UV treated implants saw no significant change from the first surgery to the second surgery, but with UV treated implants, the study showed that the ISQ value increased by an average of 3.7 plus or minus 2.9 
per month. Especially in the complex cases group, this effect is amplified quite significantly. What this means that is that in the complex cases, the ISQ1 value upon surgery was low, but the recovery rate was fast. And when we look at the cases involving the sinus, uh, we can see that the index for UV treated implants was 5.5, indicating that uh, the recovery rate was very, very fast. Next, since the UV implant is faster and stronger, and particularly stronger, as a clinician, we want the implant to last a long time, right? And we also want minimal amount of marginal bone loss. So let's look at this publication by Professor Oyama. This uh, is a study about the 3D finite element analysis of implants. And this study was done like this. He took implants, each with length 7 millimeter, 10 millimeter, and 13 millimeter, and then placed it in bone and applied 50 newtons of vertical load and analyzed where the most stress was imposed. And he also did the same with oblique load of 50 newtons at 45 degrees angulation. Then he did the FEA on it. And if we look at the results here, looking at the different lengths of implants, we can see and logically conclude that the longer the implant, the less stress is imposed on the bone. The advice for clinicians to place longer implants, if possible, comes from this kind of logic. But through this study, what we can see is that the advantage we can gain in terms of stress by using UV treated implants is much more effective than simply using a longer implant. In other words, using a shorter UV treated implant has more BIC and is more effective compared to a longer length non UV treated implant. In addition, this chart shows the range of area where more than 25 megapascals of stress was focused. We can see that with conventional non-UV treated implants, the shorter the implant, higher stress was focused on a larger area. And on the other hand, UV treated implants had almost no area where the stress was higher than 25 megapascals and also showed BIC levels of 98.2%. If we look at these images here, we can see the most uh, of the stress is focused around the neck area of the implant in conventional implants. And the shorter the implant, this red part here means that there is a big stress in that area. It means that the longer the implant, the number 13 shows less stress concentration than the seven millimeter. But when we compare this to the UV treated implant that has higher BIC and the same implant lengths, you can see that there is much smaller stress concentration in all the implant lengths. The same results were seen with the oblique 45 degree angle load tests. So because the BIC is high, stress distribution was very good even if the implant length is short. This means clinically that the UV treated implants can resist marginal bone loss much more effectively. So I've now covered the implant as well and what happens to the implantation due to the UV treated surface. And now let's look at how this system is used in the clinic. And I want to give you some examples of how it is used in my own clinic. I started using this system starting with the UV activator one. So this came out about two years ago from DO. 
With this machine, it had the advantage of preventing chances for contamination because the implant is placed in the machine while it's still in the ample. Um, and also had a very important strength, actually, and uh, that it was that there was no ozone created during the process. But the UV treatment process took 15 minutes. It is often said that you can change the world in 15 minutes. Clinically, this 15 minutes of wait time was very difficult to manage. For example, you can have the situation when there is a surgery scheduled, so you prepare the implant, but then the patient doesn't show up. Or there's a situation when everything goes well to prepare the implant and the surgery happens, but then during the surgery, you have a hard time getting initial stability and you have to change the implant size, change the length or the diameter, right? And if this happens, you got the patient on the chair, everything is open, but you have to wait right in the middle of the surgery. You probably will not have the patience for this. But I mean, I still used it because it was the best UV machine in the market at the time. But then recently, this new machine came out, 20 seconds. It's got the same advantages such as the no ozone and the full ample insertion, which prevents contamination. Uh, but the UV treatment happens in only 20 seconds. Okay, wow. Let's take a quick look at the animation here. First of all, the size is very small, so it's really easy for storage in your clinic, and the design. I heard that uh, this machine won an award for the design of the device. It's got the LCD monitor, really easy to use. Now, the main great thing about this device is that we insert the implant while it is still in its ample. And how is this possible in 20 seconds? That's the innovative technology. In the machines before, the UV rays came from only one direction, but this new device shoots the UV rays from 360 degrees, so it reduces the time of the treatment dramatically. It makes it really easy to gain the hydrophilicity. And this animation shows the carbon matter detaching and being removed, um, and the cell proliferation and migration is more easily achieved. The bone grows faster and more stronger, and this is all made possible because the implant's hydrophilicity is maximized. Yeah, I really think this is an incredible innovation and technology in this product. So we have this tool and we can use, and now we need to use it well, but we need a strategy. We have the implant, we have the UV activator. Actually, the UV activator device is not expensive to have. It has a rental service and you can pay for it monthly for a very low price, uh, probably as much as it costs for one implant to purchase. But now we need to know how is this going to benefit my clinic? How can it increase my income? Well, first of all, we can call this premium level and ask for a higher price to the patient. I think this is the easiest, the uh, very good method. And then there's this. Many patients ask this question. How long does the implant last, right? And how do you answer this question? Well, we can answer like it depends on the case. Um, it depends on how you take care of it afterwards. But at my clinic, I like to answer them back with a question. I ask, well, how long do you want to use the implant? Then, of course, the answer from the patient is, I'd like to use the implant as long as possible for a long time, right? Then you say, right, if you want to get a longer lasting implant, you should go with the UV implant. Then they ask, what's so good about the UV implant? 
then you can answer in the language that they would understand. There's no need to mention hydrophilicity or removal of carbon matter, right? You just need to say these two things. It's faster and it's stronger. We say where others can take two months, we can have the tooth in one month, as long as the bone is good. And in some cases, we can even do immediate prosthesis. If the patient is convinced, they will make the choice and pay. Also, there are many times when the patient asks for a discount due to the multiple implants, right? And in this case, what I like to offer is an upgrade of the implant used instead of a further discount. I think this has a better effect rather than reducing the price. But the skeptical patients always ask, how do I know if I'm getting an upgrade? This is a good question because they can't see, right? Seeing is believing. So what I like to do is show, to actually show them. And uh, this, the thing is that this device is perfect for showing. Um, this video is of an actual surgery at my clinic. The patient is waiting after all the drilling was done and uh, we show the patient as it happens and we say we're treating the implant right now so that it is enhanced and makes the implant faster and stronger um, and watching this the patient will be assured that they are getting what they paid for now money is important but I think there's something more important here in complicated cases when the bone is not good Instead of worrying after the surgery about the outcome of the treatment, instead of that, you know, using the UV implant and knowing that I've used a proven effective implant, that it is going to have a faster bone growth and a stronger one, and uh, being able to load the sinus case even faster than others, this satisfaction that I can give to the patient and myself, this is even more important. And lastly, because I have to see this patient uh, multiple times for the next three to five years or more, but I know that the marginal bone loss resistance is better with this UV implant, I am more comfortable and my mind is at peace. So it depends on you, the clinician. You can take more value in the increased monetary gain or more value in self-satisfaction you know I've, I've heard that um, UV is good but I never really thought about the reasons why but I realized something really big while preparing for this lecture and that's that implants age I've seen advertisements like this the inventory ages at first I didn't know what this meant but now I know some implants we have in the clinic are new. Some are one month old. Some are one or two years old. We didn't really pay attention to this part before, but after seeing this presentation, we can see that in just one day, the hydrophilicity changes and the surface of the implant changes and has an effect on the Aseo integration. We can think to ourselves, well, that's just the way it is. But let's look at this from the patient's perspective. Let's say that two patients paid the same price for implants at a clinic. One of the patients got lucky and received an implant that was only one month old and had good results. But let's say the other implant or the other patient, patient number two, got kind of unlucky and received an implant that was in storage for one year and later ended up having problems with the implant. This is not fair. They paid the same price but got different treatments. This is inequality. Simply put, I think that this UV treatment technique is able to turn this inequality into equality. After I prepared this presentation and I realized this, 
Now I treat all my cases with this UV implant if possible. That's all for my presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you.